So turn your Bibles with me. We're going to go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Imagine you have a crush on a friend, and you finally get up the courage to ask her out on a date. And you wait in anticipation for her response when she says, don't take it personally. (laughs) It's not the way you want that sentence to start. But I'm not interested in a relationship right now. Now, we all know that it is impossible to not take that personally. The lovely girl turned into a lovely dose of personal rejection. The casual friendship shot. You're mad at yourself for even asking. And adding to the pain is the assumption that she'll never think about you ever again in your life. And Landers said, at age 20, we were worried about what others think of us. At age 40, we don't care what they think of us. At age 60, we discover they haven't been thinking of us at all. (laughs) Now, let's flip the coin. Think about this for a second. How many times have you told God, don't take it personally, but I'm not interested in a relationship right now? Most of us have had whole seasons of life where God only saw the back of our heads. And what does God think of us as we're living a life of forgetfulness of him? We want to learn what that looks like today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're blessed to be here. May your spirit please teach us. Thank you for the witness that we saw today of those wonderful people that you've touched and declare that your son, Jesus Christ, is King of kings and Lord of lords. Bless us. Touch our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Through your spirit, amen. So we're going to follow. This is a very short sermon, so listen quickly, okay? All right. So Acts chapter 9, we're following the footsteps of a murderous Saul. What what was the word? What's the adjective? Murderous. Murderous Murderous Saul. And so in Acts chapter 9 verse 1 it says, Now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul was a relentless persecutor of Christians. He wanted to destroy the influence of Jesus in the lives of those that chose to follow him. And we don't often think about the author of much of the New Testament as being who Saul was the morning that it described him in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. He was mean, proud, aggressive, and ruthless in his persecution of God's followers. And his mission was to stop Christianity from spreading. And and as with a wicked eye, he saw, takes his steps towards Damascus, and he had on his mind, I'm going to eat Christians for breakfast, I'm going to eat Christians for lunch, and I'm going to eat Christians for dinner. But God had other plans. Can you say amen? Amen. God had other plans. Verse 3 And he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? What's amazing about this is that God is Jesus is giving a, a personal in, or interview with Saul. And, and what's amazing about it is he's not there to strike him down dead. He's there to try to change his life. How many of you have messed up this week? Come on, let's be honest here. Okay. 
He doesn't want any of us, though, ultimately to be a flame on judgment day that lights up the sky. He wants us all to be saved. And as you read the Bible, if you read it a chapter a day, at least five out of seven days a week, you will realize that over and over through the stories in the Bible, you find God personally coming down and engaging with human beings. He is a personal God that wants to dwell with us individually. He wants to live with us. He wants to come and visit our shack. And so Saul comes face to face with Jesus. And we see here in verse 5, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And some of you here today are kicking pretty hard. Like the ox that kicks at the goad that's trying to push them, move them forward. Saul was a stubborn man. He was self-complacent. And he thought he was good and good with God and that he didn't need to change his attitude. He didn't need to change his behavior. He was going to church. He was paying tithe. Come on, can I get a witness? <laughs> yeah. And that's the absurdity of pride is that we lift ourselves up while heaven looks down with, with disfavor on us. The Duke of Wellington once told his staff officer, God knows I have many faults, but being wrong is not one of them. <laughs> and Paul's pot pride was rolled in the dust here. It says, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me? To do. And that question changed forever the future of Saul's life. It's a question many of us are afraid to ask. God, what do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do with my day? Satan wants us to avoid the question altogether. But this question launched him into a new, on a new journey. A new journey that forever changed history, forever changed our lives. You know, many of, of you were at a massive funeral service a few weeks ago at the Cathedral of the Rockies, and it was for this dear lady, Sherry Crawl, um, who had a long battle with cancer, and she was too young to die. And I was looking, I was in the very back. Anybody here been to the Cathedral of the Rockies? It's a big place, big, huge ceiling, very long. I mean, I was in the second to back row, and I had to squint to try to get it, to, to see people's expression that were speaking up there. There's this beautiful stained glass behind it, and this one testimony, I will never forget what they said about Sherry. Sherry is sick. She's, she's not doing well. She's, 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 she's on probably her last few months of life. And she said to her friend, she said, I no longer am asking for healing. I want the healer. And that's the common thread among anybody that goes and chooses to, to follow Christ is that they find themselves connected personally. It's a very real experience. It's not something that's imaginative. It, it actually happens if we're willing to ask the question, God, what do you want me to do? He engages us in a road that opens up into so many different avenues of life and experience and joy. Last night I was writing my sermon late at night, so pray for me, please. And, and Sierra was in the, she'd been coughing for a couple hours, and I finally I was like, I, I want to help her because she just sounds terrible. So I took one of those, they call them ski socks. You know what I'm talking about? You pop them over your head. They look terrible on, right? But they, and so I, I, I've discovered in my life that if you, if for me, this is just me, this is not medical advice, this is just me, okay? I've discovered that if I wrap, if I have a sore throat, if I wrap, my throat with a scarf and sleep with it, the heat that's created from the scarf around my neck takes care of my sore throat. So I thought maybe I'll put this scarf around her neck because maybe that cough is, is, is being created by um, some, a scratch in her throat or something. And so I went to put it on her and Sierra's like, 
I was like, Sierra, let me put this on your head. And she's like, oh, what? And I was like, can I put this on your head? And she finally was like, oh, I'm sleeping. I was like, how can you sleep? You're coughing all the time. She's like, I was sleeping. So I start to put it on her head. She pulls it off. I said, Sierra, put this on your head. It'll help with your cough. Otherwise, you're going to be up all night long coughing. And so I put it on her head, and she's like, oh, I'm hot. And she pulls it off her head and gives it to me. And then she said something I won't ever forget. She said, Daddy, just put in some earplugs. <laughs> As if I was there to help her for my interest. Maybe a little bit. Maybe 10% my interest, 90% hers. But it was, it was, it, it's, it's the story of God wants to instruct us and help us. And here's the thing about it. As the Bible is tearing with us what to do, the devil is there in your face to say, if you do that, you're going to be harmed. You're going to be less happy. You're going to be neglected. You're going you're to find yourself in a worse condition if you follow God's will than if you will receive it. So I was in my room I was actually in the guest room writing the sermon last night, and Sierra was coughing. She's coughing. I'm like, it's like, all right, I'm writing a story, a sermon about God's personal with us. He personally engages in our life. So I just prayed, Lord, will you please heal her cough? Give her a rest tonight from that cough so she can sleep and get energized. I get done praying. I wait about 15 seconds, then 20. I'm like, oh. So I pray again, Lord, you know she needs sleep. Please heal her cough. Take her cough away tonight so she can sleep. About 15 seconds later, <coughs> and I'm thinking, wait a second, Lord. I don't want to be presumptuous, but you're a personal God. So I said, Lord, if it be your will, please, will you stop her cough tonight? And silence never sounded so beautiful, my friends. I was up for two more hours writing, not a cough out of my daughter. All night long she slept, not a cough. When we woke up in the morning, I heard her cough, and I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> not that she was coughing, but that he kept her from coughing all night. He kept her from coughing all night. God has a common thread among his children, and that is that he's very personal with them. There's personal encounters we have with him, whether it's through the promptings in our life or the power of reading God's word or a sense of peace in our hearts. Some of you, your troubles are carrying you. That you're literally being carried by your troubles. And Jesus says, I'll walk with you and take those from you. So for the last 2,000 years, day after day, year after year, Jesus has changed the lives of people all over the world. And this is the testimony of baptism that the Christian is no longer the same person they used to be. Saul is no longer Saul. He's now Paul. He's now thinking and doing and experiencing life in a whole different way than when he was breathing out murders against the Christians. That's the power of the gospel. It happens every single day. And when you look at North America and you say, wow, how many Christians are there in this country? We've never set foot in Israel. We've never seen a place where Jesus walked or talked or, or worked as a carpenter. We've never seen any of that. And yet, and yet, Jesus doesn't need us to go to Jerusalem to have an experience with him. He comes into our personal space every day if we're willing. So I'm going to run through... A couple pictures here, and then close. Uh, we're going to go shopping for a table. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Three of you are. All right. Okay. This is a table. You can buy it on ghostriverfurniture.com. It's a little different. It almost looks like, uh, what, what uh, state is that? Yeah, come on. Sin boldly. What state is it? Florida. I don't know. All right. Anyways, what's the price of it? Seven... I can't read it. $7.99, I think. All right, here's one. You can get buy off paragold.com. $3,200 for that coffee table. Yeah. Here's another one from Paragold. This is a cool table. You can't see it as well on that screen. On this screen, this table's $3,900 and some change. Yeah, $3,900. Here's one, $15,922 
for that coffee table. Now, this one's on sale. It was $91,000, but for you, it can be sold for $52,000. And free shipping! <laughs> you can, your, your wife can be so mad, and you can say, but honey, it's free shipping! That's salesmanship right there. You're going to save, if you buy that today, you're going to save about $40,000. Here's one. I, this is my favorite. $100,000 for this Kahiko table. Very rare wood. Um, it's, the base is made out of wood and carbon fiber uh, mixture. And then there's one more table. This one's a 16th century Tuscany table designed by Giorgio Vasari. Asking price, $11.6 million. All those gems in it, the history of it, it's only $11.6 million. Now, let me ask you a question. Will that table sell for $11.6 million? It will. Because to somebody, that table is worth $11.6 million. Now, anytime, I'm going to bring this back to our, our, our personal connection to God. Anytime you buy something, there is an equation that's always in place, and it's this. The value is equal to the price paid. The value is equal to the price paid. So how valuable are you? How valuable are, is your life? It's equal to the price paid for your redemption. What was Jesus willing to go through for you? Was he willing to suffer insult and misunderstanding? Was he willing to be beaten, going through a trial that was a mockery of justice, and, and then to be shamed through town? He drug a cross through town carrying it. And then... The robe that was put on him for mockery is taken off. He's stripped naked. His arms are pulled out. His nails are driven through his wrist, driven through his feet. And he hangs there, suspended between heaven and earth. And what does he see? I found a painting. I've never seen one before. But I found about a hundred and some year old painting. This is a very old painting as well. That is the view of Jesus from the cross looking at the people. And you see at the very bottom there, his feet. He's looking down. He sees women crying. He sees men on the right scoffing. He sees soldiers there indifferent. But you know when he was dying on the cross... He was seeing your face and mine as well. And he wasn't just seeing somebody that lives in Boise or Napa or Caldwell. He was seeing somebody that he had died. He was going to die to purchase your future. He was going to die so that you can abide with him for eternity. World without end. It doesn't stop. He paid the awful price that justice demands of sin that you could be blessed by his personal presence in your life. And we can celebrate that public demonstration of that reality in the lives of those dear 17 people and the two professions of faith that we saw today. And I want you to know that if you've been living a life where he's not personal to you, Maybe like Saul, who became Paul, you'd be willing to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because he will change your life, my friends. He will transform your life. I am here today because of the gospel. You are here today because of the gospel. This is, this is your roadmap. It shows the heart of a loving God that will do anything he can to save you, even if it means he has to give up his own life. But someday, my friends, we leave. We go home. 
and the journey will always be worth it in our minds. You'll never regret giving your life to Jesus Christ. So we want to have a special celebration of those that got baptized with a prayer of dedication. We're going to have them come up to the front here. And we're just going to surround them as elders and deacons, deaconesses, leaders. We just want to have a prayer of dedication. So come on up to the front. And Pastor Brian is going to pray for you. And then we're going to have a closing song. So please come on up to the front. Thank you, Pastor Troy. This is the kind of thing I'd like to do every Sabbath, amen? Amen. Come on up here, right up onto the platform here. I'm going to come all the way up here. I'm going to invite all of our ordained elders and retired ministers, any, any active ministers we have at this time, any of the ordained men and ladies that are here, please come on up and surround these wonderful new people that we have in the family here. Come right up in the middle, and we're going to surround you and lay hands on you. In the New Testament... Uh, They didn't just baptize people. They laid hands on them and asked for the Spirit of God to infill them. And this is what we want to do as well. Welcome people into a Bible-believing, Christ-centered, Spirit-filled church. Amen? So let's all gather together. And all, again, uh, all of our elders, I hope you're up to retired ministers, let's get right around them, not just in the back. I know they like to hide in the back. But come on here in the beginning. Men, I see, see they all head to the back, you see. Come on in the front, too. We need some in the front, all right? Yeah. Come on in the front. Gather all the way around. All the way around. Okay. It's a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit crowded to kneel here. So I'm going to just pray, and uh, let's all put our hands on these wonderful new people. And please pray along with us, would you please, as we do this? Our gracious Father in heaven, What a joy it is as a church to welcome in new family members, a church that's growing worldwide by well over 3,000 new family members each and every day on average. What a wonderful thing it is right here in this, this Treasure Valley to see these people take their stand for Jesus and for this wonderful message. And Lord, you know we must need them or you wouldn't have brought them. We need them in our family. They have gifts, and we ask, Lord, that you would now come close with your Holy Spirit and bestow upon each and every one of them a gift of your Spirit. Some may be more than one gift, maybe several gifts, whatever is your choosing according to your will. But give them these precious gifts to become givers in the family. We know you didn't bring them to us, just become pew sitters, but they're to be active disciples advancing the kingdom as you want all of us to be. And as they give these gifts toward the family, toward the body of Christ, Lord, help us in return to love them as Christ would want us to love them. Help us to exemplify the very best as a church family. I know we all fall short, but Lord, help us to realize that our our example matters, to treat them as Christ would treat them, to love them as Christ would love them. And we ask, Father, that you would now, again, give them these precious gifts of your Spirit. Bless them and keep them in this beautiful family that you have brought them to here in this valley. And, Lord, we ask now that as a church family, we would wrap our arms around them and we would uh, just welcome them in with open arms. For we know we all fall short. We all have our shortcomings. But, Lord, we all want to grow in Jesus, and we all want to be like him. And so look forward to the day when we look forward to the day when Jesus will come. And may not one up here be missing. May not one in this building be missing on that day when Jesus comes. We thank you, and we trust them to your care as you now trust them to our care. In Jesus' precious name, amen.